Live from KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A night of entertainment at a local venue canceled Saturday for safety reasons. One of several drag shows nationwide threatened by extremists this week. Armed protesters disrupted a library reading in California and others forced a show cancellation in Ohio. Courtney Freeman talked to local leaders from the LGBTQ plus community about their collaboration with law enforcement now for future events. Drag shows nationwide threatened by anti-LGBTQ plus extremist groups. It's unfortunate that we see it happening here in San Antonio as well. The Starlighter here is a local San Antonio venue that was supposed to hold a drag show over the weekend. They took to social media saying they had to cancel it because of extremist threats. Drag queen Brian Hernandez was supposed to perform that show and in a statement today said, in part, we can't turn a blind eye on issues like this only to wait until the last minute when one of our family is hurt or shot dead. We feel violated, we don't feel safe, and we demand something be done about this. These threats are out there um, and, and we can't say, oh, there, it's only uh, folks talking. There's not going to be any action. We saw what happened at Club Q. We've seen what's happened at, at drag shows across the U.S. Pride Center of San Antonio Executive Director Robert Salcedo Jr. says the trend has him working closely with law enforcement. I met with the FBI last week and I've been in contact with our LGBTQ plus liaison at SAPD. Just really making sure that we are being proactive and not reactive in these situations. He said it's a blurred line between keeping the community safe and standing up to hate. Now we really got to think about who are attending these shows. Um, is the threat credible? Like, where where do you draw that line? And there's no easy answer for that. He hopes the public will educate themselves on what drag shows actually are before spewing hate. It is the art of impersonation. It's the art of entertainment. Nothing that they're doing at a drag show is harming the folks that intend to protest. With the community's support, Salcedo feels confident choosing strength over fear. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Two people in custody, a third suspect on the run after San Antonio police uncover an alleged human smuggling operation on the northwest side. The officers responded this morning to a trailer home in the 7000 block of Buffalo Trail, where they say they found six people inside being held against their will. Police said the people were from Honduras and waiting for payments from their families. They told investigators they'd been there for a few days. We have uh, several individuals that we contacted uh, victims appears to be victims of human smuggling. We're getting some water, we're getting some, some food, uh, but that they, they did let us know that they were being uh, detained against their will by armed individuals. Police said one of two people taken into custody lives at that home. The third suspect drove away in a vehicle when officers arrived and got away after a short chase. The victims and suspects were taken to Homeland Security offices for further investigation. A man convicted of severely beating his four-month-old son got the maximum sentence today. Terrence Harper was sentenced to 99 years in prison for the 2018 assault on his son, Trace. Trace's mother tells us that beating left him with a cracked skull and traumatic brain injury, which led to cerebral palsy and Trace being legally blind. The case led investigators to take a look at a 2012 child death case where an infant allegedly died in Harper's care. The capital murder trial in that 2012 case is expected in the future. One by one, dozens of autopsy photos show just how four women were killed back in 2018. The man on trial for their murders, a former Border Patrol supervisor, Juan David Ortiz. Erica Hernandez tells us more about what was revealed by the Webb County Medical Examiner. It's week two of the trial for Juan David Ortiz, the alleged serial killer accused of fatally shooting sex workers from Laredo in 2018. Medical examiner Dr. Corinne Stern described how each woman died. It went through the bone of the mandible and it terminated its path in the right side of the C6 vertebrae, the six cervical vertebrae, and that's where I recovered it. The photos too graphic to show, but hard for all in the courtroom to see, causing a juror to pass out. That juror excused from the trial, but an alternate stepping in. As testimony continued from the medical examiner, it was revealed each woman died from their gunshot wounds and some even had defensive wounds. This is consistent with a defense type wound with her trying to hold her arm up like this or maybe across her face. 
There was no reaction from Ortiz today as those autopsy photos were shown in the courtroom. This trial is expected to last throughout the week. If found guilty, he would automatically be sentenced life in prison without parole. At the Kedena Reeves Justice Center, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Texas Parks and Wildlife now helping the Comal County Sheriff's Office in the search for a University of Houston student who was last seen over the weekend at Canyon Lake. Officials say that Amir Ali was on a camping trip with two friends when he went for a walk Friday night. He never came back. His friends found his phone and his clothes by the lake shore, and that's when they called police. Canine units and boats are being used in this search. Anyone with any information on his possible whereabouts has to call the Comal County Sheriff's Office at 830-620-3400. North Texas still reeling from the shocking abduction and murder of a seven year old girl northwest of Fort Worth. Authorities say a FedEx driver confessed to the crime and is now behind bars facing kidnapping and murder charges. But the question now is, how could this have happened? The people across Texas asked to honor seven year old Athena Strand today, wearing pink to remember the young girl who police say was abducted and murdered by a FedEx driver. That driver, Tanner Lee Horner, now behind bars, charged with capital murder and aggravated kidnapping. He's being held on a $1.5 million bond. We really can't get into the content of, of the um, confession, but I will say that we, we have a confession. The FedEx says all their contract workers go through the same required background checks as their staff employees. Police say the 31-year-old Horner did not have a criminal history. The Wise County Sheriff saying Horner delivered a package to Athena Strand's home, reportedly saw Athena when she came back from school, abducting her last Wednesday. Investigators believe Athena died within an hour of her abduction. An Amber Alert was sent out Thursday. One day later on Friday, the first grader's body was found. It hurts our hearts to know that the child died. Athena's mom writing on Facebook, I cannot describe the pain and absolute anger I feel. My princess was taken from me from a sick, cruel monster for absolutely no reason, end quote. Make your children aware. You need to educate them to stay away from strangers. And stranger is exactly what the sheriff says Tanner was, saying that he was not related to the family, did not even know them. It further deepens the investigation into why he chose their home and their daughter. Let's take a look at traffic out there right now. This is the TransGuide camera I-35 at Brooklyn. You can see that the upper and lower levels in the southbound lanes, those are the lights coming towards us. That's where traffic is really slow going. Things looking fine in the opposite direction, but no big accidents to make you aware of. Tens of thousands of Afghan refugees and their families who fled to the U.S. are now at risk of being deported back to Afghanistan later this year. Many are applying for asylum or have green cards. Jesse DeGoyado tells us the fate of those who haven't now depends on Congress. An Afghan father's carefree moment with his little girl is a far cry from the chaos of the U.S. withdrawal after the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Those days are gone, but right now we are in a safe place. Unlike thousands of others, Mohammed has what they don't. This is what so many Afghan refugees want and need, a green card. If they have their green card, they're okay. After the fall of Kabul, thousands of American allies were granted humanitarian parole for up to 24 months. We're we're running out of time because now we're a good 18 months into that time frame. Do you want to send him back to the war zone? A war zone where he says only darkness awaits. There's no hope for any good future over there. Unless Congress adopts the Afghan Adjustment Act. Congressman Joaquin Castro says it would help at-risk Afghans flee to safety in the U.S. and provide a pathway to citizenship for Afghans here who can't return home. On behalf of refugees, Constantino has helped. Please support the Afghan Adjustment Act and let's get this thing done because it's been swirling around for many months now. But Castro says he's optimistic the bipartisan bill should be signed into law by the end of the year. If so, Mohammed says other Afghans can have what his family now has. Here, everyone has their own freedom. Jesse de Goyado, KSAT 12 News. 
Let's take a live look outside with live cam right now, and you can see traffic very busy out there. The hustle and bustle. Christmas right around the corner. <laughs> sure is. And get ready for more fog, drizzle, and dampness to develop. Visibility is fine right now at 10 miles, but that's going to be changing uh, within about five or six hours. You'll really notice that fog settling in. So mostly cloudy, then foggy. South wind at about 5 to 10, especially around it after midnight. That fog's going to get pretty thick. Temperature is not changing much, uh, basically just in the 60s all evening and all night tonight. We're going to talk about how thick that fog is going to be and how long it's going to last through the morning tomorrow and how many more days we have to deal with it in just a bit. Thanks, Adam. Well, it's been nice to see at least some rain after that incredibly dry summer, but even in the second driest year on record to date, sauce customers never went beyond stage two water restrictions. The water utility says it's because of all the sources they pull from now. If we do have a repeat of the drought of 1950s, we are ready for it. OK, so where does Saws get its water today? The answer is more than just the Edwards Aquifer. We dive on in in a new KSAT Explains coming up at 630. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. A camping trip ends with a man missing at Canyon Lake, and now one of his friends is sharing his concerns. Nearly three days in and counting, there appears to be some confusion between investigators. Plus, all of these things are in the hands of, uh, of a government that doesn't share our values. Entertainment or security threat? The FBI is now raising a red flag over a popular app, how your personal data is being used. Plus, a special meeting at Uvalde CISD, what board members are expected to discuss behind closed doors. That's tonight on The Night Beat. Well, the road work continues in the Alamo City and throughout the month of December, we can expect to see several road closures taking place. So we're going to take over here to the northeast side. Loop 410 striping and barrier placement. This has actually been current since Sunday, December 4th, and we will see a portion of it wrap up on December 10th. This will be overnight. So those late night owls, early bird commuters watch out and plan ahead of time because nine in the evening to 10 in the morning is when we will see alternating lane closures along Austin Highway northbound to Loop 410 West bound the connector ramp. Let's take a jump now over here to State Highway 16 Bandera Road utility work. Now we know that there's always a lot of work that takes place there, but this is actually going to be a portion that continues up until Friday, December 9th. Does start early nine in the morning to three in the afternoon, but we can always expect those crews to be out there a little bit earlier. So again, we will see alternating lane closures this time in both directions from Loop 1604 to Diamond K Trail. All right, we have one more for you here along I-10 over on the east side of Bear County overlay work. Now there's a lot of work there as well. It's been current and should a portion of it will wrap up on Wednesday, December 14th starts at nine. It should wrap at four in the afternoon. The I 10 westbound frontage roads will see alternating lane closures right there at Ackerman Road, but just updated the list of traffic closures. Scan that QR code that just popped up on your screen that will take you to our KSAT traffic page. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll find a full list of current closures there. A new at six, nearly 1,000 toys and gift cards collected by the Bernie Independent School District for the Blue Santa Toy Drive there. Bernie ISD officials say all 12 campuses in the central office got involved, teaming up with the Kendall County Sheriff's Office and the Bernie Police Department. The Bernie Toy Drive ended with the fourth annual Cookies and Cocoa Staff Appreciation Event at Bernie Academy. These gifts will go to kids throughout the Bernie community. How about that? Almost a thousand. Tis the season. Is the season. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12. Beautiful picture. All the lights shining brightly at Travis Park downtown. Good to get this view because during the gray, we or during the gray, during the day, <laughs> we get a whole lot of gray. That's same thing. Same thing. Yeah. It's been during the gray for the last week, it seems. We get what you were trying to say <laughs> with the gray during the day. Today. Today. Take Monday. it away. Said Steve on the hay. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Dr. Seuss all over around here, you know? There you Just go. Rolling exactly. <laughs> oh, boy. Get ready for more gray during the day on Tuesday. <laughs> I'm going to stop it right Yeah, now. let's stop this. And uh, there, there's going to be a lot of drizzle and fog developing again, and that's going to be a trend pretty much every morning the rest of this week. Let's get a look at the current visibility and conditions out there. It's fine. Visibility 10 miles. 
But the air temperature 72, dew point 64. Those two numbers are going to come together in the middle, meet in the middle in the mid 60s in a few hours, and that's going to mean the air is saturated and going to lead to the fog and drizzle. A little bit ago, Kerrville was reporting seven miles of visibility. Now back to 10. Uvalde reporting seven miles. We're starting to see those lower clouds developing. And remember, fog is just a stratus cloud at the ground. That's all it is. It's a stratus cloud that we can walk through and drive through, but it can reduce the visibility, of course. So here's our future cast for visibility. By 8 o'clock, still okay. We're talking six, seven miles locally, but it's around and a little after midnight when the visibility really starts to fall off and is below four miles. And then for the morning commute tomorrow, look at this, 7.30 a.m., maybe a half mile visibility could even be less than that in some locations like it was earlier today with a quarter of a mile or less visibility. I think we're going to have a repeat performance or at least very similar tomorrow morning. So another dreary start to the day where it's kind of hard to get up and get moving and get motivated because of the drizzle, fog and dampness. But then by about 10 11 a.m. we'll see that fog burn off and a few peaks of sunshine possible. So one reason that we're seeing that fog this time of year is the dew points are up in the 60s. Now in November, the second half of the month, we were in a weather pattern of cold front followed by a cold front followed by a cold front and that would give us that dry air from the north and we couldn't saturate we couldn't make that cloud here at the ground but with this gulf moisture and humidity in place deweys in the 60s and longer nights this time of year too then that translates to areas of morning late night and morning fog and notice how there's no real change in our dew point trend here the rest of this week and through the weekend we're not anticipating at least not right now any kind of meaningful cold front to really sweep away the humidity and cause any big changes. Here's our overall pattern. Pretty quiet across the state, but I do want to point out we've got an upper level high, big blue H just to the south of us. And so with that clockwise circulation around it in the upper levels, that's really deflecting any big disturbances away from us. It's keeping real good rain chances away. We're just having these small scale nuisance, uh, little drizzle and sprinkle, you know, patches of sprinkle and little showers move through, but that's it. We're not looking at anything good. There is a little better chance in West Texas and then North Texas, just out of our area where we have this conveyor belt, very narrow conveyor belt of moisture coming in from the Pacific with little disturbances in it. That's just to the north of us though. And you can see that narrow band of clouds. That's that little plume of moisture that's going to be traveling just to the north of us throughout this week and not bring us any real rain chances. Unfortunately, around here we're looking at 20% and that's mainly just in the mornings for little sprinkles and that's about it. Nothing uh, really meaningful or adding up to much. Let's talk temperatures. 60s off to the west, 70s to the east. This is where we had more sunshine east of I-35 today. So you've Aldi now at 65. 73 in Seguin, 71 south side of Stinson Airport and officially in town we're at 72. Here's our 12 hour forecast. We'll only fall into the mid 60s tonight. That's where we'll start the day tomorrow, 6 and 7 a.m., about 65 degrees. And then by the noon hour, squeezing in a little bit of sun briefly, kind of like today, at that point, 73. High temperature, maybe 75, but if we get more sun than expected, then it could be even higher. I mean, Pleasanton, a little more sun, probably closer to 80 degrees. Bernie, about 75 for the high. And those temperatures hold steady most of the week, low to mid 70s for the most part in terms of our highs. No strong cold front. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, I am very happy to see that the UTSA Roadrunners are actually going to a bowl game outside the state of Texas. Yeah, and what's cool about this is for the parents, and a lot of people were hoping maybe Hawaii or Bahamas, but for the parents and the costly expense it is to travel yeah. to get there, this is perfect here, yeah. going to Orlando. When we come back is, what does head coach Jeff Treader have to say about matching win streaks and records with Troy in their bowl game? And a former UTSA Roadrunner gets emotional after picking up his league-leading sixth interception. Coming up. UTSA Roadrunners are headed to Orlando where they will face the Troy Trojans in the Duluth Trading Cure Bowl to kick off the bowl season on December the 16th. These two teams are both ranked in the college football playoff with UTSA at number 25, Troy at number 24. Both come into this game at 11 and 2. Coach Jeff Trader, who has now won back-to-back -back Conference USA titles, has asked that he likes the idea of taking on a team with the same record and the same 10-game win streak. 
No, that's not true. I'd like to play somebody not very good, and I'd like to win. <laughs> no, I'm not that guy. Uh, I want to play somebody not good, just to be honest with you. So, no, I don't want to play those guys. But we're excited about it. I'm a competitor uh, in that aspect, yes. But, no, if I had my tr druthers, I'd play the 5-7 and seven team that got in on their – whatever it might have been <laughs> kickoff in Orlando one week from this Friday except for 2 p.m. San Antonio time look who is leading the NFL in interceptions former UTSA Roadrunner Tariq Woolen picked up his six on Sunday in the Seahawks 27 23 victory over the Rams rookie got a little emotional during his press conference where it took him back to draft day where he didn't go until the fifth round finally selected with Seattle's 153rd pick overall man I think it's a blessing I remember just on draft day, just sitting like, uh, just like sitting in the living room a little bit. I don't want to get too emotional, but I just remember sitting in the, uh, like the, just in front of my family, just getting calls from different people, and I was just embarrassed because, you know, I, I was thinking there was a team getting called cause I was just hearing different stuff. I'm just happy to get my name called, and it's just a blessing, honestly, and I'm just happy I'm here. All right, congratulations to the University of the Incarnate Word Cardinals. They're headed to the quarterfinals of the FCS playoffs after they were able to beat Furman 41-38 at Benson Stadium on Saturday. Walter Payton Award finalist Lindsey Scott Jr. threw five touchdowns, including the game winner to Cole Wilson, and set an FCS record for most touchdowns in a single season with 62. Scott threw two interceptions in the first half, but rebounded to secure the win. The Cardinals will face number two seed Sacramento State Friday at 930, and they know they can't have any self-inflicted wounds moving forward. We're a little rusty and just too many penalties and like I said, the turnovers, you know, are kind of uncharacteristic. The same with the penalties. So just one of those things. And, and uh, you know, it was a big game. Uh, I think the emotions were high and we, and we talked about that, you know, controlling your emotions and the discipline aspect of it. And, and um, you know, just something we got to continue to get better at if we want to win the whole thing. All right. For the first time since Texas State made it official that UIW's G.J. Kinney is their new head coach. Kinney is speaking about about it before their big win on Saturday. Texas State confirmed Kinney would succeed Jake Spavital as the Bobcats new head coach after four seasons in San Marcos. The, the Texas State one was the one I wanted, and uh, I'm happy I, I was able to get that one and, and start this new journey uh, when I get done here. And Texas State posted this on social media today. Coach Kenny's first look at his new office in Bobcat Stadium. But first, he has some unfinished business to, to attend to at UIW. Texas Longhorns will face the Washington Huskies in the 30th annual Valero Alamo Bowl on December the 29th in the Alamo Dome. This will be the Horns' sixth appearance with a 4-1 record with their most recent appearance in 2020 when the Horns lit up Colorado 55-23. And for the Huskies, this is just their second appearance with their first against Baylor in that historic shootout in 2011, 67-56. We didn't get to go to a bowl game last year. We didn't earn it. Uh, so to earn a, a, a bowl a bowl bid this year. I think it's great for them as well that they that they get this experience against a really good opponent. We got a lot of experienced staff and uh, have a good feel of what the team needs to uh, continue to improve and be ready on December 29th. All right, kick off between number 20 Texas, number 12 Washington will be at 8 p.m. on December the 29th. will be broadcast nationally by ESPN. Always a great bowl event. And that's a great matchup. Love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Despite this incredibly dry year, we haven't seen the escalating drought conditions that we were dealing with in the past in terms of water restrictions. And there's reason for that. Case that explains where our water comes from next.